welcome to Genesis Volatility's educational series. Today we'll be explaining E, where does it come from and its importance, as well as the natural log. This is going to apply to options trading as well as mathematical intuition underpinning continuous growth. Let's explore. The legend of the chessboard. Now, there's many versions to this story, but let's go ahead and just go with my version. The legend of the chessboard goes something like this. A long time ago, there was a very powerful emperor and a grand wizard came to visit this emperor one day and introduced the game of chess. The emperor was so pleased, he couldn't believe how cool this game of chess was, that he granted the grand wizard any one reasonable request as a reward. The grand wizard was very wise and knew that he couldn't request something that was too extravagant or the emperor would refuse. So the grand wizard convinced the emperor to grant him one grain of rice, which would double every day for each square on the chessboard. Now on the first day, that grain of rice was a mere grain of rice, one single speck. On the second day, that doubled to two. On the third day, it doubled to four. On the fourth day, it doubled to eight. Fifth day to 16, so on and so forth. Now, especially for computer science people, two to the 64th power or 64 squares on a chessboard is an incredibly large number. But the idea of one grain of rice for the first day is extremely modest to the emperor's perspective. Anyways, long story short, we know how this story ends. This little game that the grand wizard came up with or this bargain has incredible exponential growth. Something to notice about this growth rate is that it compounds daily and it's discrete. It isn't continuous. But when we talk about continuous growth or E to the power of one or power of two or power of 0.3, we're talking about continuous compounding growth rates. Let's explore what that looks like. If our story's grain of rice didn't grow on a discrete daily basis, but instead grew continuously, what we would see is that we'd have a smooth curve on the growing pile of rice, as opposed to a discrete step-like function. Now, rice can't magically appear on a continuous basis, but numbers can do that and money can get close to it. So if we step away from rice and think about money, what we can think of is that if $1 becomes $2 at the end of tomorrow, we can see a smooth, gradual assumption of money as time goes by. As we see our money growing in a smooth fashion on a continuous basis, if we add the compounding component to it, what we can start to conceptualize is that the money that I'm earning every moment is also earning interest as well. And if I zoom in on the interest component and really just look at the interest that I just earned, well, that interest earns interest. And if I zoom in a little bit more, the interest of the interest also earns interest. And I can keep zooming and zooming and zooming. And I notice that interest of interest of interest of interest earns interest. And this thing or this concept never, ever, ever has an ending. My interest of interest of interest earns interest for infinity. And that's essentially what E is. You'll quickly notice that E, E itself is a forever number. If you try to count all the decimals of E, you'll realize you never get to the end. And the further you get down the line, say to the millionth decimal, is equivalent to zooming in a million times of the interest of the interest of the interest forever. One nice thing about money is that you can only really round down to the nearest penny. So there is sort of a discrete ending when working with cents and dollars. And essentially, 
we can just use the first four digits of E to get the continuously growing compounded rate. So how do we work with E? When we look at E, say E to the one, what we're really saying is, what is the continuously compounded return of one or 100% for one period? So what does that mean? Well, it means that if I invest say $1, at 100% rate of return, which is continuously compounded, for one period, which is normally one year, but it could be one day or one week or whatever, then at the end of the period, I will have $2.71. So essentially my $1 will have grown from one to 2.71. So that is the rate of return continuously compounded. Now, we can also go the other way. Using the natural log, and the terminal value, so in this case, the terminal value is 2.71, and at the beginning of the period, the money was worth $1. If I apply the natural log of 2.71, the output will be the continuously compounded rate. The rate of return was 100%, or one. Great, we can now grasp the idea of continuously compounded returns. So why is this important to option pricing? Well, the main caveat with asset prices, in particular cryptocurrencies, is that cryptocurrencies can't really go below zero. And so the lower bound of the asset price itself is zero. And if we therefore use continuously compounded returns and we measure implied volatility using continuously compounded returns, that incorporates the asymmetry of infinite upside to asset prices, but finite bounded by zero downside to asset prices. Let's look at something like 200% implied volatility. While 200% implied volatility says that one standard deviation over the year is up or down 200% continuously compounded. Now, something can't lose 200%, it can only lose 100%. But if we have 200% continuously compounded to the downside, that's really a loss of about 86% in absolute terms. Because since the asset is continuously compounding, as losses accumulate, the denominator is getting smaller and smaller Therefore, the losses get smaller and smaller in absolute terms. So that's the significance of using continuously compounded returns in option pricing. Let's look at another interesting concept. I'm often asked, how high could implied volatility actually go? Can it go to infinity? Well, in practical terms, implied volatility is not really going to go to infinity. Because once you get past 200, 300, 400, 500% volatility, essentially the option becomes less favorable than just buying the asset itself. If you have a thousand implied volatility on the asset, well, the asset is just an option because the asset can't go below zero. Just like your option, your long option can't go below zero. Well, essentially the asset becomes a long option. So there is an upper bound in practical terms to implied volatility. But technically speaking, I've seen implied volatility go to infinity. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you remember the April 2020, when oil prices went negative, the Black-Scholes model broke. Continuously compounded returns to the downside wasn't a reasonable assumption anymore. And as prices approach zero, the implied volatility went crazy because no matter how high implied volatility went, the model assumes that the price can't go below zero. And so the Black-Scholes model broke. So technically speaking, yes, implied volatility can go to infinity, but practically speaking, not really. There's an upper bound because at some point, if implied volatility is high enough, you just buy the asset. I hope you found this video helpful and remember, find edge, capture alpha, and slang size.